welcome welcome to C7. Thank you for uh thank you for taking the time out of your very busy lives and uh you're all um kind of uh, I I would describe you as sort of legends in your own right when it comes down to um ocean activism and regenerating the health of our of our blue planet. So um yeah, thanks again for making the time for this. Um what would be great just to kick off just sort of we're going to pass the mic around the virtual mic and it'd be lovely just um just for for our listeners and viewers just to get a bit about a little bit about your story and we'd love just to know a little bit about um who you are some of your work and i guess just the sort of the focus right now in 2021 um of your kind of ocean water mission if you like that would be a really nice way just to get us going so um uh, whoever would like to uh, to kick off the mic is yours i'm alexander cousteau and um i've really grown up in the ocean community, uh, joining my parents on expedition from the time I was four months old. And uh, there was really nothing else for me to do but to continue in, I guess, in this path. Um, but my, my views have changed over time. And um, while I grew up with a very strong sense of this conservation ethic that my family instilled in me and, and that I was able to see them um, working on firsthand. I realized uh, a few years ago that in spite of all of their good work and all of the amazing work that's been done for oceans over the course of the past few decades that have really helped us move ahead um, in the protection of our oceans, we have still experienced net loss in our oceans year after year, uh, to the point where we've now lost half of our blue natural capital, half of the whales and fish that swam in the ocean when my grandfather first invented scuba diving are gone to us. And so um, I've kind of refocused on how we can rebuild that lost abundance so that by 2050, my children aren't the generation of my family that will write the obituary for the ocean. And so everything that we are doing at Oceans 2050, which I started with Professor Carlos Duarte, is focusing on those catalysts for rebuilding abundance and, and bringing our oceans back. And we started with seaweed farming and creating a voluntary carbon protocol around regenerative practices um, for the ocean and seaweed farming. Um, but we're also looking at uh, coral reefs and, and the future of seafood and, and a number of different things that can help us get to a net positive for our ocean. Amazing. Thank you, Alexander. And, we, and we'll, dig, we'll dig more into your work as, as we go on. Um, Cyril, I'm over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, I'm Cyril, um, founder of Palais for the Oceans. And our mission is really to tackle these three big issues like plastic crisis, um, climate crisis and fishing crisis. And of course, this is not something we can do alone. Um, at Palais, we, we totally believe that we are just a little, little, little piece, a contribution to already a very broad existing movement. And what we try to do is to encourage, to inspire and to enable as much as we can, you know, and the nucleus around Palais is built is its collaboration, is creativity, but it's also eco-innovation. Because when you're looking at all these environmental issues we are facing today, you come quickly down to how we're doing things. What are the materials? What are the ingredients? What are the practices? And when you look a little closer, then you come to the conclusion that behind all these environmental issues we are facing is an, an economic failure, really. And it doesn't mean that I'm anti-capitalism at all. You know, I, I grew up, my, all my opportunities I had as a designer, as a consultant, as a strategist was built on economy. But also knowing business so well, I know how difficult it is to change for them and to justify big investments if there is no crisis like a pandemic or something, you know? And so our goal really is to, I would say, create examples, proof of concepts. Um, so we're working with like brands, um, with governments, even with individuals in, 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 I would say on one side, creating symbols of change, it means like, products or solutions that are done in a different way that people excite themselves for and then either copy them or join. Or on the other side, really try to turn big organizations into activists, like an Adidas or the government of the Maldives or the World Bank. And how can you turn these 
big institutions that often are, or they are seen as the villains, as the polluters are the problems, how can you turn them around and, and show that it actually can be more lucrative for everybody, more positive, more life-giving, more fulfilling if you're changing the way do, um, things are being done. And that means what ingredients, what materials are we using? Um, what products are we designing? How we, are we consuming? How, are we, how do we understand success? How do we define leadership or successful leaders? Um, it's really about defining and designing a new economy. And I believe that the creative class has a lot to do with that because all these big businesses that are creating the solutions, but also mainly creating the problems today, they have been started by somebody who had an idea, somebody who came up with something. So I believe the core of all big business, even big organizations was some group of people or even an individual that had an idea with good intentions probably even. And over time, um, it, people detached from that. And I think now is the moment to have new ideas. Now is the moment to understand and accept that our old concepts don't work anymore and we are running ourselves against the wall. And um, what Alexandra just said is the, 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 the tr truth, right? We are losing wildlife in rapid speed and we are creating conditions under which it's very hard for the natural world to exist and very soon also for us. So it's time to really invent our way out of this mess. Amazing. Thank you, Cyril. And we're, and we're gonna we're gonna dig into, you know, particularly into this kind of innovation, creativity, and the what's emerging from from all all of that brilliance as well. Um Jay, over to you. Um give us a bit of your bit of your story. Well, I'm a, a marine biologist and um I'm just thrilled to be on this conversation with all of you because that's we ins get inspiration from the work of others. So you know, Dan and um Work you've been doing with your team, uh, so your your examples of it are inspiring, and and the creativity that you bring, in the little experiments. I just love watching all your experiments. And Alexandra, um, you, your brother, your mother and father, uh, first your grandparents, your whole family really is an inspiration. Um, and I think that's maybe. You know, inspiration is not not enough on its own, but we're in we're in this place th with this year ahead, where um, there's an opportunity to help people think differently, and I think with regard to the ocean, uh, we certainly need to do that. Um, one of the big upgrades, I think, is just on our basic ocean story. We've been using the same story for a very long time, and it hasn't worked. Uh, I think we need to expand the ocean story most people um, aren't thinking about the ocean right now. Uh, they aren't thinking about their wild waters. They aren't thinking about nature. Um, we can change that by telling a better story about what a healthy ocean is really worth. And I'm not talking about dollars and I'm not just talking about the ecological value. Uh, it's the emotional well-being aspects that are usually left out of the story. And so that's where I find hope. And that's where I find maybe an accelerator and a catalyst is um, bringing neuropsychology to the table and um, uh, reminding people of what Alexandra's grandfather knew. And, and he led the charge with the language. We somehow deviated from some of the things he, he said. Uh, maybe we can get back to that, but um, really good to see everybody. And, and you didn't mention that small book that you wrote called Blue Mind, you know, a little thing that... Uh, <laughs> we, Sucked we, the life out we'll, of my life for a few years there, yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 have a, we'll explore a bit of that, um, Jay, as, as we go through. I guess, um, I may, thank you so much for, for just giving us some of your stories and there's so much to the work that you all do. Um, bear, as we sort of, you know, we're in 2021, um, we're looking at, you know, this weekend, the G7, um, we're thinking about the awareness that you've, some of you touched on it of, of our ocean and its role, it's kind of life support for this, for life on earth. And there's a, there's always a sense. And I think you just, you just spoke to that a bit, Jay, as well, that um, do we have enough sort of global awareness of, of the sort of the critical role our ocean and, and waters play in, in, in life on earth? Cause there's a sense that um, as you spoke to it, you know, many of us are sort of, you know, living in cities or we live and for many of us, it's the ocean is always a sort of distant thing. What's your sense around that? Do we, 
um, is the kind of vitalness, the criticalness of, of, of our ocean and of, of our relationship to water? Is it really out there enough in our, in our cultures and societies? And uh, I'd love to get your views on that and maybe, you know, maybe signals of where you're seeing that is happening or, 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 or where there are some sort of worries or, or concerns and what, and what could we be doing about that? I'll just open that up to whoever wants to just step in. Off the top, I've, in my career alone, I've seen awareness explode, literally. And, and I can remember early on, the talk was, why can't, we, why can't we get people to pay better attention to the ocean? And um, now we have you know, kings and queens and rock stars and billionaires lining up to save the ocean. So I'm not saying that the job is anywhere near complete, clearly, as Alexandra pointed out, but um, we dreamed of this opportunity 30 years ago. I mean, it was a, it was a pipe dream, I mean, really an impossible dream. And here we are, um, you know, there's a billionaire's club for the ocean, apparently. So that's a step forward in a way, I guess you could say. Um, brands are aligning and that's good. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as Cyril, I was just going to speak, you know, when Parley came onto the scene, you know, you were very, very, there was a very strong focus, if I remember, about really trying to bring, you know, the every second breath a message um, from the ocean. That was a very sort of big message that Parley brought. And, you know, I, I see that in, even in my work today. It's still a, it's still a thing that just blow, blows a lot of people's heads off. They still haven't quite computed that, you know, the ocean is driving at least 50%, probably more of our, you know, of, of the oxygen that we breathe. And, and that alone seems to be such a, uh, an insight, which, you know, is critical for life and yet is still um, hidden in, in some ways. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that we humans, we live in so like human design worlds and environments that we tend to forget uh, what allows us to be here, right? We don't connect. And um, the oceans, nature, um, even air uh, is an abstract. And um, we keep it that way, right? And if we learn, most of us, and it's a very small group of privileged people who actually are able to poke through that abstract and, and go into the natural world themselves and make their own, uh, build their own relationship and their own feelings and, 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 and create, like, find this place in their own heart for, for the sea or for life out there. But most of the people are not allowed to do that. You know, they are like too far away. It's, it's, it happens on screens, it happens in books, it happens in tales. And, and it's great um, that we achieved that, I think over the last um, nine years since Palais started, when we, when we opened doors, um, we, actually the reason why we did was that nobody spoke about it. We learned about it, we were newbies, we had no idea. And we saw that we are contributing as a design firm to the death of the sea. And that might be our legacy. And we turned around and, and started Palais. But, Back then, people couldn't imagine that the oceans would even die. They couldn't imagine um, such big of a collapse, you know? And today we all can. And that has different reasons. Um, I think the environmental movement has done an excellent job in educating, but also um, some have taken on the cause and put it onto their billboards, right? And I have to say, even even if it was a polluter back then, and I was attacked heavily for partnering with Adidas in 2015 when I announced it, I was attacked. I mean, there was a signature list of 200 people against me um, to take me down for working with the, the sinners, right? Um, <laughs> today, I have to say, they're they are, they are driving awareness on a massive scale and they're changing their company and we need these examples. We don't anymore need awareness. Um, the awareness is there. Now we need manuals, templates, role models, and, and real good blueprints. And we have to prove that things can be changed very fast and it's actually worth taking the risk. Because the truth is we are asking people to change the way they're doing business or the way they're living. Because the way we did it for the last 50 years doesn't work out anymore with that population. So that is a sacrifice that we're asking for. And we can't convince people to do that, to give that sacrifice, if there's not something on the other side that is like attractive for them, um, be it that they are recognized as more responsible people, <laughs> make more friends or, or have a better life, or in the best case scenario, um, learn how nature and the sea actually affects themselves. But unfortunately, that's the smallest group that is right now experiencing that. Thank you, Alexandra. You, I mean, you've grown up literally in the ocean. What, 
what are you seeing with um you know culturally and across society now in in the sort of this understanding of its of its sort of criticalness to to all life on, on earth uh, i would definitely um echo what jay and cyril were saying i think you know what i what i've been really pleased about is the role of youth in the conversation um you know fridays for the future and and so so many young people that are not just speaking up but that are being given a seat at the table that are being given columns in newspapers and, and are being heard. Um, I, I think that's tremendously important because they have a less of a vested interest in how things were and very much a vested interest in what will be. And, um, and I think they're becoming very powerful and very influential and, and that gives me a lot of hope. The other group that I think is, is really getting active that's exciting for me are, um, is, is the financial industry. You know, the, the oceans are the least funded of the global goals and philanthropy alone is not gonna bridge that gap. And so seeing investors looking at, you know, how they can invest in new technologies, how they can invest in innovation and help scale those, you know, startups to really have an impact on rebuilding our oceans is important. Um, and finally, you know, there, there was something that I, I learned a few years ago, um, and, and it, it, it happened that over the course of conversation with a dairy farmer of all people in Vermont, we were making a film about um, the, how they had changed their farm practices to reduce their impact on Lake Champlain because Lake Champlain has big blue green algae outbreaks every summer due largely to the dairy industry. And at the end of the day of showing me around his farm, um, I asked him how he felt about all of these changes that he'd made to this generational family farm. And he said, you know, I feel amazing because for the first time in my life, I feel like my, my values and my actions are aligned and I'm leaving a better world for my children. And I thought that was really profound, um, but I was, I was pregnant at the time. So I went back to Berlin um, where we were living and, and had my baby. And, um, and then a few months later, I was hosting a documentary for National Geographic on organic cotton. And I was in Madhya Pradesh in the middle of nowhere in a very rural traditional community uh, interviewing a, an organic cotton farmer who was telling me about all the changes that he'd made to his farm. And at the end of the day, I asked him through the translator, you know, how, how does it feel to have made all these changes to the land? And he said, I feel amazing because for the first time in my life, I'm able to align my values and my actions and I feel like I'm leaving a better world for my children. And that's when the penny dropped for me that there is this human need that is largely unspoken in our society because our society is not built now to allow us to align our actions and our values. You know, those of us who wanna reduce plastic in our daily lives are bombarded with plastic. Um, and, and the list goes on and on. Those of us who wanna make better decisions in where our food is sourced, have trouble getting the information, there's, there's so much dissonance in um, how we want to live and how we are able to live in this system that we've created for ourselves. And I think that's contributing, and I'm sure Jay has a lot to say about this, but contributing a lot to eco-anxiety and eco-grief and, and women, even women I know who say, I don't wanna have children because of climate change. And I think it's largely because we are not able to live the way we want to live. Um, and so when I see startups and small companies that recognize this and are creating opportunities for us to live in alignment and still have what we need that's beautifully packaged and smells nice and does you know whatever we want it to do it gives me a lot of hope um, big companies i think would do well to 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 see that because big companies can can still become irrelevant rather quickly we've seen it over and over again um, and, and young companies that get it are growing quickly and, and that's exciting because I think it, it indicates that we're, we're turning a corner um, in our business models in how we invest and what we expect and um, in articulating our ambitions as wanting to rebuild what we've lost rather than just sustain what's left is a big part of that. Amazing, thank you. I wanna... Um... Yeah, just, I guess, move into that whole area of uh, this, I guess, creativity and innovation that we've sort of spoken about. 
um, in response to all you know these crises that we're 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 sort of facing everywhere right now. And of course, there's the sort of business and the organisational response, and then there's the response of everyday people and um how how important is that to be i mean Cyril, look, I, I, this, I remember these right i think this was your number two shoes my son was like 13 i think when these came out and he and he hunted the internet far and wide to to find a pair um and and you know was immediately you know you know just really enamored by this the ability to take that waste stream and and to do something awesome with it so let's let's talk about this the role of creative and i'd love to sort of expa- explore that in its you know, in its widest sense, you know, the business response, yeah. but also just just us as humans. What what are we seeing out there? How important is creativity and innovation uh, right now for for what we for what the oceans are facing? It's all it's the solution. To be honest, I believe that um, it's all about innovating and creating now. Really, it's about um, developing new technologies, letting old technologies go, and um, plastic needs to go. We we are aware of that. Right, fossil fuel, we can't burn it anymore. Fish, right now, we can't even hunt fish. I mean, we shouldn't eat it anymore, even um, at least if we can afford to live from other sources. Um, the truth is that humans have been extremely creative always, and the, the biggest motivation to create was to survive. Um, developing tools came out of that, right? I mean, oh, I'm, I can actually make fire. Um, then I can, whatever, I can stop scrubbing the, the core of bones and, and this is ongoing. And I think at this point now, it's just that we probably accept that our ingenuity that we have been so drunken of, like so full of ourselves, is probably not as superior as we th- suggested. Well, probably it's, probably we are just very heavy handed with things and probably nature is way more high tech. And I think this moment to humble down and to say, how actually were things done before we arrived on this planet as a species? How are, what, what colors my eyes? What grows my hair? What repairs my skin? What is actually the packaging of a banana or an orange? And, and go back to that and, not, and, and try to understand it and not be that arrogant anymore and say, oh my God, we are so much better than nature because they can't speak our language. And I think that's the moment where we will and we are unlocking true secrets, you know, of like, making new making things in a different way but also rethinking the whole old idea of business because when we are really honest not so much changed right we, we made some things and we learned to sell them a lot and and then suddenly we're rich or not and others are being exploited it's an old concept and i think it's now really time to reinvent economy and design and innovation is at the core of that because culture often changes through technology and i want to compare this moment we're in right now with the digital revolution. Digital changed everything. Yeah, knowing to program uh, zero and ones and, and having an app and a phone and all these things now suddenly in a digital space changed the world in a way. And now it's time to transfer that to a material revolution and question everything what is material. And I feel the drive is there, the motivation is there because we are all scared, we all know that the future is not looking good if we continue doing what we have done for the last 50 years. And, and therefore there's a big motivation to invent. And I would like to compare these two revolutions to each other, the so digital and the material revolution. And right now it's about being suspicious, suspicious, enthusiastically suspicious of everything what is old and probably and reevaluate, but also be skeptical what is new, still open and, and interested um, to find new technologies. I think that's the moment in time. Love that. Thank you, Cyril. Jay, when, when we think of um, creativity, innovation and, and bringing this into where we are today with the, with, uh, with the ocean and our, and our waters, where does, it, where does that take you? Where are you, where are you being drawn to? Yeah, I'm listening, listening to this conversation, I'm reminded of this basic idea that our, our emotional well-being is the basis of sustainability. And so what Alexandra was saying about that feeling of alignment, whether it's a farmer or a business person, that feels good. And there's a reason why that feels good because um, emotionally we feel well. And so if we're designing, if we're innovating from, from a place of emotional unhealth, that's never going to be sustainable. And most, you know, most of our lives feel that way. Some organizations feel emotionally unwell. Some businesses certainly do. Um, and you know, any, any grouping of people can feel can feel off, um, but when you when you're on, when you're gr- in a groove together, 
it feels good. And that's what, that's where innovation happens. That's where creativity happens. And we've all experienced it, whether in my high school rock band, when, you know, when we were just getting along, the music sounded better um, or a sports team and certainly in, in business and in, in the nonprofit and, and government roles that, you know, people are involved in. So, you know, connecting the dots there, um, re a reminder that a healthy ocean, healthy waters, healthy nature is a source of emotional well-being. And I'll push back a little bit on the idea that most people don't have access. I think most people do around the world. And in fact, I've never met a person that doesn't have access. So to water uh, in some form where they can feel better. Um, so we broaden out our ocean story to be a water story. We include 8 billion people. Wow, that's cool. Um, we talk about emotional well-being being connected to the well-being of the water. That's a better story. Out of that emotional well-being comes calm, collaboration, creativity. That's what we need. Uh, we don't need more red mind. We don't need more fighting. We don't need more screaming. We don't need more fight, fight or flight responses. Uh, that's not where creativity comes from, nor is it where collaboration comes from. And it, it, it isn't where compassion comes from either. So that was a mouthful, but that, those the things bouncing around in my head, uh, listening to my friends here. Amazing. Thank you. Alexandra, I, was, I guess um, <clears throat> thinking about this kind of role of creativity, but I'm also thinking about looking at some of your work um, and, you know, you talking more about this um, shifting towards a, a kind of different narrative as well around a more regenerative narrative, a more equitable narrative around uh, the ocean, um, you know, a, a, away from maybe how we've you've talked again about how we um, often think about conserving, but actually we must, you know, it's more about bringing life back. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about that. I just l last thing, little little nuance. If I, I remember, you know, I grew up. I was born in the early seventies, and your your grandfather. I mean, at that time we had three TV channels, I think, uh, and uh, they stopped at like at nine o'clock at night. But I remember, you know, watching watching your grandfather. You know, he brought this awe and this awe and wonder. I mean, for us, we lived we lived miles from the sea. We barely knew what it was. But you know, me and my brother used to sort of dive under the dining room table after he'd been on. You know, and was sort of in this world and I, I so i guess you know it'd be interesting to know a little bit about this 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 work you're doing to sort of maybe take us to a different sort of level of consciousness if you like um well again i, I think going back to my comment earlier I, I i think that articulating our ambitions is is really important you know to get to a better place we need a vision of where to go and um what what I think inspired you and, and so many other millions of people around the world um, was that my grandfather was able to, to, to engage them emotionally about a place that they'd never seen. And, and he created this shared understanding of what the ocean was and the beauty of it and, and the value of it. Um, and then we, we, created the, these terms, sustainability, conservation, to try to capture the goal of, of maintaining what we had, right? Um, but a word like, like sustainability, um, which to be honest, I've, I've kind of become allergic to over the, over the years, it, it's a reference marker, right? You can, you too, Cyril, <laughs> um, you, you could sustain a coma patient for um, years. That, that, that word is so you bad. Know? It comes from the total <laughs> wrong time. It's so bad. You have to let that go. I think that should we be the do. decision today. Let's let this word go. <laughs> um, it, it's it, it, and that word really died for me at a at a fishery symposium in Canada, when I was uh, when somebody a fishery scientist explained to me that North Atlantic cod stocks are at six percent of their original historical numbers, and they're considered a sustainably managed stock. And that's when I just was like, okay, well then sustainable doesn't mean anything. What are we going to use? Um, and another, another moment that really sticks out for me, I was at uh, the Blue Meeting in Lisbon, which uh, gathered ministers of the sea and fisheries ministers from around the world. And the term, I, I was like the only person from, from the nonprofit community there. And in the audience, before I got on stage, I was listening to minister after minister after minister from, from around the world talking about sustainable exploitation for the blue economy, 
And I was like, what does that even mean? And if these are the terms that we're using, we're just going to accelerate into the ocean, making the same mistakes there that we've made on land. Because the way we articulate our ambition, frankly, kind of sucks. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't illustrate or paint a picture of what we want. And so what is it that we want? We wanna restore what we've lost. We want abundant oceans for our children. Uh, we wanna regenerate and rebuild marine bio biodiversity. And if that's what we want, then how do we articulate that as an ambition, as a vision of the future that we can move towards together? Because we all have that image of where we wanna go. And so that was when I, I scrubbed like sustainability and conservation from my vocabulary and, and started talking about restoration and regeneration, rebuilding. And all of this, you know, might seem like pie in the sky. I mean, so many people think that our oceans are already lost and there's nothing we can do to bring them back. We've lost half of them and they're so vast. How can we restore them? Um, but the work that we do, as I mentioned earlier, is really based on a scientific uh, paper that was peer reviewed and published in Nature Magazine last year by Carlos Duarte and a number of other world-class marine biologists that are specialists in these issues that really lays the framework for how we can do this. What are the, the catalysts for rebuilding our oceans um, and, and how can we accelerate that? And, um, and that's what we're focusing on because the beauty of the ocean and one of the principal ways that it's different from, from land ecosystems, that oceans can regenerate very quickly. You know, if, if, you, if you stop the overfishing, fish stocks come back. You know, if you stop the pressure, these ecosystems can rebound fairly quickly. And that makes this idea of rebuilding our oceans possible if we act in the next decade and if we mitigate climate change. But otherwise it is possible. So we have to talk about that, not conserving marine ecosystems or sustaining our, our, our oceans. We need to rebuild them. And, and what I like about that is that it gives us very clear yardsticks to measure success. Sustainability doesn't do that. It's been co-opted. Everybody has a sustainability strategy now and most of it is boilerplate and uninspiring, right? But rebuilding and restoring and regenerating our oceans, there's accountability built into that vocabulary and it articulates our ambition. It gives us yardsticks for progress. Um, and that's what this moment requires of us is to be very clear because we have a limited time to be able to do this. Thank you. I'm going to just segue, Jay, to, to you. You know, you 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 wrote this little book a, year, a few years back, uh, Blue Mind. You know, the one you didn't mention. It's the but you know an awesome uh, piece of work. We recommend anyone should 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 read this book. But you know, you've you've always said a long time, which which I think connects and builds on what Alexander and Cyril have been talking about. Is this what is this story? What are these narratives that we're we're working with? And you've often been someone that's talked about what's in, in the sort of mainstream narrative around our ocean is it's very mechanical, the, the language we use, and we talk about resource and economic value and all these sort of important things, but we miss this kind of innate human story, this connection we all have with water. Um, I'm thinking about the pandemic, I'm thinking about as we're, you know, hopefully emerging. Uh, I know some places are, you know, we're all in very different places, but you know, what's gone on with human health over the last 18 months? And it feels like we're in a moment where, you know, there's a lot of people are carrying a, a lot of trauma and, and it feels like maybe there's this, you know, now is this is a time of well where where we're, we're, we're maybe more open than ever uh, about the possibilities of, of, of a deeper connection, a deeper story with with the water and, uh, around us. Um, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, <clears throat> well, Alexandra, her comments require me to adjust a statement I made earlier. I said, uh, Emotional well-being is the basis of sustainability. I'll, I'll update that. <laughs> Emotional well-being is the basis of regeneration and rebuilding. <laughs> so marketers, marketers will always take our best words and wreck them. So just be careful with regeneration too. Before you know it, that'll be um, misused and misdefined and overused. So um, words are fun. That's kind of the, my, my take on the word sustainability. I love the word sustain. I think it's a good word. I'm going to use it my way. <laughs> um, so we're coming through this pandemic thing. And before it, we were in a crisis already of red mind. Um, the American Psychological Association puts out a report called Stress in America, which 
you know, could probably hold for a lot of other parts of the world. Um, we were experiencing high levels of anxiety and stress pre-pandemic, leading to high unacceptable levels of burnout and breakdown, the red mind and gray mind. Um, and then the pandemic happened and things got even bigger or worse or harder for a lot of people. Um, I think that's, that's an um, a interesting place to have this conversation about, about the ocean, about our waters and about nature, <clears throat> helping people connect the dots between their emotional well-being, their plans to be part of this regenerative economy, and to do so in a, in a strong way, in a creative way, in a courageous way. Um, so when we go to tell our story about this, in this case, the ocean, we shouldn't add to the heap of stress. So that, you know, sort of marketing 101 maybe, um, people are already pretty stressed out to the breaking point. So if we show up and say, oh, by the way, here, let me give you five more really scary reasons for you to be stressed, they're not gonna like you. <clears throat> they're gonna associate that feeling of stress with your brand, with your face perhaps, um, with the name of your, your movement. So that's just a, kind of a simple thing to do. Um, if we say, hey, I'm part of this regenerative economy and you know what, it feels really good to be part of this. It makes me really happy. It makes me feel aligned. Um, I really enjoy the work. I really enjoy the people I work with. Do you want to come? That's way better than <clears throat> I'm part of the, the gloom and doom club. <laughs> Do you want to come along to my meetings? Uh, so, and I don't want to sound, you know, like it's all, it's all good news out there. Of course it's not. We, we cover that every day. If we're working in, in the ocean realm, we see it all the time. Um, but I think understanding how um, our, our minds work, understanding behavior change uh, is at the core um, of solving these problems. And of course, marketers hire neuroscientists. Uh, they pay them a lot of money to help them craft their message. Um, so we should, we should learn from that and, and make sure we're doing the same thing, especially uh, as we've had this year that we've had um, that has challenged people in a lot of, a lot of new ways, in a lot of old ways. So, um, there's, yeah, it's just some thoughts, but yeah, I'd say get, you know, get to the water if you can, if you're feeling stressed out and take somebody with you, uh, who needs it. Cause you know who that is. And, uh, if you're in New York city, it's not that hard. If you're uh, really all around the world, you can get to a body of water. If you find that that body of water that you love needs help, help it. That a lot of bodies of water need help. Join that regenerative uh, movement that Alexandra speaks of. So last thought on this before we <clears throat> before we get to um, a bit of a wrap up. But just you know, Parley's always, but you at least I've always seen you as um, getting very close to people that have relationships with the water, whether it's the communities around the world that you work with, whether it's the ambassadors you work with. But there's always been a sense of a very sort of human story that underpins your work. What what where else can we be going? You know, what is how do we get maybe this this human story more into the into the mainstream? What what's what are you what are you sensing? What are you feeling about this? Yeah, it's all about humans. Um, it's about optimism, really. It's about a realistic optimism. It's about um, understanding that we all have a power, right? And, um, and the smallest idea can blow up, you know, if you have a good one. Um, what we learned, though, is that you don't want to be a crusader. You don't want to go to places and preach to people, you know? Um, if you want to share your ideas and show what you're doing and, and invite others in, um, that's pretty much the way we work at Palais. And in a very organic way, people came and said, oh, I want to run the Maldives. Um, oh, I want to run Mexico. I want to run Palau. Or, and suddenly we are operating in 30 countries, right? And th that's, that, that's kind of the way we, we operate. We feel like, let's just be very clear with your intention, show what you want to do and show how you're doing it, you know? And, and be open, but also don't, um, don't promise, you know, and just like be very realistic. And I think at this point in time, we can really believe that humans have the power to turn things around. I believe in that because we were able to destroy it all. 
So we created all these materials, all these technologies, all these ideas that turned out to be destructive in a lot of cases and often based on good intentions. The guy who invented the plastic bag wanted to save trees, right? Um, fossil fuel saved some whales. I mean, at the beginning, at least, you know? And I think we just have to accept that ideas have a due date, you know? In some moments, it's a great material to have. And the other one, you don't need it anymore. You can just look for something else. And I think if you are more playful, but on the other side, um, feel more responsible also about our doings, that it's not just okay to put everything out just because you had an idea. You want to actually predict it's success. And I think that's new to us. We are always predicting failure. We are scared to fail. I think we should be scared, we should be scared to be successful, right? If I have the idea to, be, to put an NFT out, what does that mean? Is that a good thing? And then instead of like always just looking for where can I put my name on, you know, like we have a responsibility and everybody has, and we all have a power and it can be this one person that listens to us. And that's something very beautiful because that means that Billions of people can change the world individually or as groups. Amazing. Thank you. Um, guys, we're going to, we, you know, it's been awesome to have you here. We've rattled through our time. Um, I wanted to finish um, by asking you, each of you, just to maybe um, uh, uh, two questions I'd love you just to sort of speak to, really. We're approaching the, the G7 down the road in Cornwall uh, with all the world leaders uh, amassing. And um, just right now, what would be two things, two questions. One, what would be your, your message to world leaders right now when it comes to, to the ocean? And the second one for all of our listeners and viewers, what advice or an invitation for action would you, would you recommend to folks uh, listening at home? So a message to world leaders and a, um, a, a piece of advice or an invitation, uh, an action that um, folks at home could take. All right, well, I'd, I'd say, if we're speaking of the world leaders, I'll, I'll speak their language or um, our value equation around a healthy ocean and healthy waterways, and nature is broken. And when we undervalue anyone or anything, bad things happen. And that's what we've done. To, that's what we've done to each other um, based around race and gender and socioeconomic status. We undervalue each other. And that's what we've done to the environment. We've, undervalued it. So fix the value equation by bringing in all of the values, not just the economic values, not just the ecological values, but the emotional values. And that fixed equation will be part of that regenerative economy. I, I promise you that's, that's what we're seeing everywhere this idea is applied. Um, and so as far as a, what, what I would advise people to do would be um, practice that, get you know, take somebody who's, who's feeling the weight of, of, of all of this and jump in the water whenever you can. Um, make sure our first responders understand this concept because they've been serving us and over, overworked for a long time. Make sure our frontline health practitioners, um, make sure journalists who have been covering bad news heavily for this past year plus. We can't afford our um, professionals to burn out at the peaks of their careers as we're seeing. So nature can heal us. It literally can. Our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our souls. So we need to do that. And when we connect public health, physical health and mental health with taking care of the environment and restoring places, it's, it's a huge accelerator. So that would be my message for world leaders. Connect those departments uh, in as much as you can. Uh, use the right language uh, around this truly restorative economy, regenerative activities, and make sure you're taking good care of your, your own mind and your own body. Thank you, Cyril. Yes, I mean, every business, uh, sorry, every country is today running um, with an engine and that's economy. And today's economy is toxic. Where consumers, users, we, we people, <laughs> normal people um, will not accept that anymore. So we're gonna opt out of harmful and toxic industry. Uh, we will not buy their products anymore. And it's the same as when, the more, when analog shifted to digital, all the companies who didn't innovate fast enough went out of business. And only a few countries in the world had the head start. 
And I think right now, the job of every leader is at stake. And the position of every country in the context of global economies at stake and new leaders will be born and they will understand how to collaborate with nature. They will understand that technology is not any more to poisonous, toxic. They will understand to uncipher the science um, of nature, material science. They will understand that um, there is so much out there which we don't know. And if you don't let go and we don't stop protecting the old technologies we're running on, um, these people will go out of business and they will not be elected anymore and their countries will have a disadvantage. And yes, people scream and change is pain, but it always was. Switching from a fax machine uh, away was pain. Understanding television doesn't work anymore and the internet was coming was pain. Innovation is always pain and people scream, but you have to get through it. And strong leaders have the courage to do so and actually endure that criticism that comes for a short moment of time in comparison to the big change that you can actually cause when you believe in the vision. And I think the vision today needs to be that we collaborate with nature. It needs to be eco-innovation. It needs to be that we're letting go of toxic chemicals. We let go of burning fossil fuels and we have to stop killing all this life out there. And I think everybody feels it by now. And the people that actually act will lead and they will be the leader of tomorrow. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, well, I would, I would tell them what I've told um, world leaders in the past, which is um, please, when you are creating a framework for the blue economy in your country, frame it in regenerative terms, not in sustainable terms. Um, be ambitious with your blue economy and what can be accomplished. For the love of God, stop funding overfishing. Please change how subsidies are distributed for the fishing industry. And, um, and ensure that the, the policies that you create are implemented in the field because we can create great you know, fisheries legislation, we can create great laws, but if the practitioners and the managers aren't implementing them, then they're worthless. Um, so I, I think that, that those are some, some really big wins for the ocean if, if world leaders would finally listen um, to what we've been saying for a while and actually implement those, those things. Um, and, you know, just for, for people, I think this, this is really easy to say, but um, demand that companies and the people you give your money to treat you as a contributor and not a consumer. Um, it's, it's so important that we start to see ourselves as contributing to an outcome, whether it's the status quo that takes us in the direction we don't wanna go or change that can take us to a different place. We are contributing and um, we ought to be treated as contributors by the different industries um, that, that we give our money and our time and, and, and our attention to. Um, and then teach your children to love the environment, teach your children to love the ocean, teach them, you know, as Jay said, to, to experience it and to revel in it and, and to understand it and not fear it so that they can help protect it. Amazing. Thank you. In the Stair community for joining us here for the C7 uh, um, and for all the work you all do. Um, uh, we're right. We're right alongside you. And um, yeah, uh, uh, good luck onwards in 2021 and uh, we'll all be in touch. Thanks so Thanks, much. Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks for your doing. Thanks so much.